Amen. Thank you for that. Brother Brady, great truth in that song. Aren't you glad that mercy stepped in your life? Man, I'm glad to be at church today. I don't know about you. You're singing well. I was so enjoying singing with the congregation and grace that is greater than all our sin. And I was thinking before we sing that last dance, well, I hope Brother Dalton has the instruments drop out in the chorus because I'd like to hear this congregation just sing together with one voice. And boy, sure enough, he, he said that. And I thought, boy, give that guy a pay raise for leading songs. Boy, I would have to get up where he did that. And, and just to hear this congregation sing, sing about the grace of Jesus Christ. Boy, touch my heart this morning. I hope when you come to church, your heart is touched as well. Listen, we don't come here, you don't come here. I don't come here uh, like a fast food restaurant. You know, give me something good and hurry it up. All right, we'll get out here between, between you know, between 12 and 3. All right, we don't come here just to put on some nice show. What you got for us next week, Pastor Howell? No, no, we come here to worship God. As we sing, as we have others lead us in worship, singing of the songs, things like that, where all of our hearts are supposed to be turned like this, like this. I hope your heart is touched this morning in something. If it's not, if your heart's not been touched, you may want to have a spiritual checkup in life. Be something to touch your heart, singing about the grace of God, the power of his blood. Man, something's got something's to hit home right here, something. I know not every song will touch you the same way. I get that. I understand that. And not everyone will react the same way. That's okay as well. All right, I don't mind if you say amen. I'm all for that. I don't mind uh, those things, those expressions. We're not here to just honor who's singing. We're trying to honor the Lord. Some will pray while we're singing. Songs going on. That's fine. Altar's always open to First Baptist Church. We're not trying to manufacture something, but I'm also not trying to hinder the Holy Spirit from working in, in this place. And he's been so gracious to us, and week in, week out, we see lives touched by the gospel. People respond to the gospel in, in just in various ways. If your Bibles are open to Psalm chapter 51 this morning, Psalm chapter 51. We've been on this series of fabulous lessons from the first three kings, and we looked at three weeks ago that God wants to make a message out of your mess. I don't know about you, but my friend, I make enough messes in my life, and I bet you do too. I'm thankful for the saving grace of Jesus Christ, but I'm going to be more thankful when I'm finally in heaven and don't have to battle the flesh. Because that flesh inside of me, inside of you, struggles against the Spirit. Paul said it this way, the things I ought to do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, I do. All right, Paul recognized the battle. And because of that battle, there are times that you and I will make a mess out of things in life. Not because necessarily we want to, not because we're trying to, though sometimes that's the case, but because we still battle the flesh. Now, that's not an excuse. That's just reality. John says in uh, 1 John chapter 2, he says, These things have I written unto you that ye sin not. Meaning, listen, my friends, listen, Christians, if you follow what I've written to you, you won't sin. But then he, he goes on with the very next phrase, and if any man sin. Basically saying, listen, you're probably going to mess up again. You will mess up again. And when we sin, we have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ. With the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Called mercy, grace, love of Jesus, the love of God, Jesus Christ. We're going to make a mess out of things, and God wants to make a message out of our mess. And in this particular account that we've been looking at with Saul and David, they both made a mess out of things. Looked at last week, Saul's faux apology, a fake apology. Looked at how that sometimes in life we do the same things. When someone catches us, we blame shift. We self-justify. We try to sidestep. And ultimately, we're not really, really sorry for what we did. We could be sorry for consequences of getting caught. Contrasted with the story of King David, who also made a royal mess of things. Saul's is found, I believe, in 1 Samuel 15. David's in 2 Samuel chapter 17. But keep your, keep your finger open to Psalm 51. I pointed out last week that between Saul and David's mistakes, I would have given more weight to David's mistakes. Saul was called upon to perform a task of the Lord, and he performed it about, oh, mo most of the way. You can pick a percentage, right? 80%, 85%, 90%. He performed most of what God asked him and just left a few things undone. And God said, I've rejected you as being king. David didn't do anything God asked. And none of it. David's supposed to go to battle. He stayed home. 
David should have kept his eyes to himself. He looked and lusted after a woman. David should have left her alone. He called her back to the palace. David should have confessed his sin and said he covered up. Then he, he got Uriah killed, committed murder in this. David did nothing that God said. Saul did mostly what God said. And yet God forgave David, kept him being king, and put his sin away from him and rejected Saul. I made this statement. The difference is not the gravity of the sin, but the genuineness of the repentance. We looked at last week how Saul didn't really repent. This morning, with the Lord's help, I want to look at Psalm chapter 51, where we hear the cry in David's repentance. A whole year has passed. David's been living with this sin. And, conversely, with the woman in the sin. One day, the prophet shows up, the name of Nathan, and tells David a little story. A little story about a, a man who had some sheep and a neighbor who didn't have very many sheep. The story went, Nathan said there was a man and he had a lot of sheep and a neighbor came and he only had one sheep. The man who had lots of sheep had a friend show up and the man who had lots of sheep didn't want to sacrifice his own sheep so he went next door to the neighbor who had one sheep that was loved by the family and took that one sheep, killed that sheep to serve as guest. At the same time keeping all the sheep that he had just fine. Boy, the Bible tells us that Nathan was just incensed. He first thought that man should die, and then kind of backtracked on it and said basically, well, he should re repay him fourfold. And then Nathan, as I picture in my mind, points that little finger, or big finger, right in Nathan's face. I'm sorry, David's face. Nathan says, thou art the man. And right there, David, whoop, done. David was done in my opinion, because he'd already been struggling with this sin. Our problem is not normally a knowing problem, it's a doing problem. It, we, we find out later on when David prays through this prayer that he doesn't get much sleep. Why? Because of the sin. It's been sitting there. It's been messing with him. He's been putting it off. But when David gets right, he gets all the way right. My friend, this morning, I'm going to challenge us that when God deals with us, we respond in true repentance. I'm afraid that often we respond in that faux apologies. I'm sorry, God, for messing up, and I'll stop the consequences. God, I'm sorry, so stop the bad feeling. Rather than God, I'm yours. This morning we'll look at three changes that repentance is. Can God forgive? You better believe it. Can God forgive you? Absolutely. Can God forgive whatever sin may be in your life? Absolutely. If and when you repent. Psalm chapter 51 Let's look at that psalm together. I'd like to read the whole psalm this morning. If you would for a moment, put yourself in David's shoes. You've made some terrible mistakes. The gravity has weighed on you, and now David is singing this. Singing this. It's written in a way that others have heard it now. So it's a public, it's a public thing going on not just inside it's on the outside too and let's listen to david as he truly repents before the god of the universe verse one have mercy upon me O god according to thy loving kindness according to the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me against thee. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the inward part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken 
they rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure. Unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with a burnt offering and a whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that during these next few moments that you would touch us with your spirit and by your truth. Lord, in our life, I and all of us are apt to make many mistakes. But Lord, you desire forgiveness, cleansing, to make us whole again. Lord, I pray that this morning we'd learn something about repenting in your sight. Lord, would you quiet our hearts and different distractions that could cause disruptions. Lord, I pray that you would let those not happen this morning. And Lord, I also ask if someone's here multiple people here who don't know you as their Savior, that they would repent from their sin today and trust you as, their, as your, their Savior today. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Psalm 51. Powerful, moving psalm. Could you kind of hear David sing that psalm a little bit? Could you hear maybe the, the remorse, the regret? Inside of the psalm, could you hear some of the agony? Could you hear some of the pain inside of Psalm 51? Psalm 51, I believe, teaches us what genuine repentance looks like. Psalm 51 is not just an I'm sorry. Right? That would have been a quick psalm. Lord, I'm sorry. Psalm 52. That's not what we have now, is it? Psalm 51 is not just a whoopsie-daisy. Also a short psalm. Psalm 51, as you read it, you don't find David blaming someone else, right? David took it on himself. He said, it's all my fault, and I'm sorry. He didn't say, oh, Bathsheba, if she hadn't been on the roof, oh, if the servants hadn't brought them, oh, if Uriah had gone home, oh, if Uriah had fought better. No, David was not faking this. He was genuine in his repentance. And my friend, in our life, if we're going to find true forgiveness from the Lord, then we must truly come in repentance to God. We can't come and say, God, well, I want to quit this habit. I want to stop this attitude. But Lord, take away the situation and then I'll be a better Christian. Lord, I'll be a Christian if you do this. There are some who want to come to Christ for salvation, but want to make a deal with God. After salvation, Christians want to make a deal with God. Lord, you do this, and then I'll be glad to serve you like this. That's not the way the Bible works. My friend, we come to God on his terms, not our terms. We don't get to write the parameters. God does. In Psalm 51, David shows us the parameters for repentance. Now, the first time that the word repentance is used in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 6. And it actually speaks of the Lord repenting that he made man. If you remember Genesis chapter 6 in your Bible, you'll know that that's right in the account of the flood. I submit this morning that repentance, genuine repentance, involves three changes. And we'll look at each one. Three changes. A change, first of all, of perception. True repentance, genuine repentance, involves a change of perception. Number two, a change of affection. We'll look at that. And number three, a change of direction. We'll find this all in Psalm 51, a change of perception, a change of affection, and a change of direction. Can you help me with that? So first of all, it involves a change of 
perception, a change of affection, and a change of direction. One more time. It involves a change, of, first of all, of perception, a change of affection, and a change of direction. You say, Pastor, why are you giving us a quiz? Because in life, you're going to make a mistake like I am. In life, God's going to touch you. He's going to bring through his word or through a godly friend, someone who through the word says, listen, thou art the man, thou art the lady. And we must respond at that time with true repentance, not just an I'm sorry, not just an oopsie, not just a, oh, it's the woman thou gave us me, Adam, in the garden, all right? Not the snake. It must be God. I'm sorry. Let's look at this, these three changes this morning. A change, first of all, of perception. Look in Psalm chapter 51 where we see how David had a change of perception. Now remember, when he's there involved in this sin, he thinks everything's great. That's why he sinned. That's why you and I sin, because we think it's great. Now afterwards, not so great, but in the middle of it, sin is pleasurable for a season. David thinks this is good. When David has to cover up, he still thinks this is okay. But now David has a change of perception. Number one, verse number one, he says this, the very first four words, have mercy on, upon me. God, I have perception change. I'm sunk. I'm in a whole heap of trouble. See how now he's not trying to cover up any longer? You see that? Unlike King Saul, Remember King Saul said this when Samuel confronted him. Well, Saul, or I'm, I'm sorry, well, Samuel, I tried to, but I was afraid of the people. Remember that? He, he, was, mo he was moving the blame, and he was, he was, he was self-justifying. Oh, I was just afraid. David doesn't say, I was afraid. David doesn't say, whoops, you know. He says, listen, have mercy upon me. He understood, first of all, what his sin was. Verse number two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He says, listen, God, wash me. Because of my sin, I am filthy before you. I'm not filthy on the outside, God. I'm filthy right now because of my sin on the inside, a change of perception. For that year, though he was struggling with it, I believe, he, he was acting like it was okay. Now a change of perception. I'm understanding what my sin is. Verse number three, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Verse number four, against thee, the only have I sinned. First of all, David understood what his sin was. It was iniquity. That word iniquity in verse number two means it means perversity or perverse. It says, God, what I did was perverse. It was wicked and it was wrong. If we want to have true repentance, we must acknowledge that what we have done, what we are doing, is wicked in God's sight. It's not just an alternate reality. It is wicked in God's sight. It is not just a little oopsie choice I made or just a sidebar that I did. No, no. This act that I did, this thought, attitude, or action is wicked before God. It is filthy before God. He goes on to say this. I acknowledge, verse number three, my transgressions. That word transgressions speaks of a rebellious spirit. You see, when we sin, we are rebelling against God. It is not just like, oh, there's two ways, my way, God's way. And I chose my way today. That's nice. Next time I'll choose God's way. It's that when I choose my way, I go right in the face of a holy and mighty God. And David says, I acknowledge my rebellion before you. You know, when we justify when we blame shift, we're trying to bring down the severity of our actions. In a small way, children will do this. Now, why didn't you get this done? Why isn't your room clean? Why isn't the trash out to the curb? Small things, right? Not situationally life-changing, but spiritually can be life-teaching. And you know what, kids? seem to always have an excuse, right? Why aren't the dishes done, Johnny, James, and Danielle? We get answers like this. I did my part, all right? 
but fill in the blank, didn't do their part. Now, that's not the question I ask now, is it? I didn't ask who has done their part of the dishes, all right, or how were the dishes divided this morning or this afternoon. I just ask, why aren't the dishes done? And they don't want to answer that question, all right, because the answer is because we didn't do it. We didn't obey you, dad or mom. And ultimately, we rebelled against the request that you asked us to. They want to say, no, no, well, it's my part and their part. And so really the issue is just parts, all right? And so this is this part, changing the dynamics. David doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't say, well, it's just my part. You know, Bathsheba had a part in this too. He doesn't say that. He says, I acknowledge my rebellion before you. In order to be saved... We must acknowledge in our life that our sin makes us in rebellion to Jesus Christ and God Almighty. In order to get right afterwards, 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, we must acknowledge that what we're doing is in rebellion to a holy God. Acknowledge what my sin is and who I sinned against. Someone said this, that sin is a terrible taskmaster. That sin promises the best but pays with the worst. Promises honor and pays with disgrace. Promises pleasure and pays with pain. Promises profit and pays with debt. Promises life and pays with debt. Promises or sin is certain to ring at your doorbell. But it's our fault if we invite him in for dinner. Years ago, there's a story in the newspapers about a lady who lived in Florida. She lived in Big Cypress Swamp in South Florida. Her home was an old shack, and it sat uh, by an old pond where every morning she had to go draw some water for some of the animals. Apparently in the pond, there lived an alligator. Despite the danger, the lady allowed the alligator to live there for many, many years, and it seemed to be tame. Well, the article in the newspaper, apparently um, she didn't bother the alligator, and the alligator didn't bother her. Until one day, while she was drawing water from the pond, the alligator swam under the water, plunged up, and grabbed the old lady's hand and ripped it off her arm. She rushed back to the, pond, to the, to the shack, called uh, 911 medical attention, and uh, they, they got her all patched up, and they went out and they caught the alligator and recovered the old lady's hand, though I don't believe they were able to, to reattach it. Later on that day, park rangers went to the pond, caught the alligator, and had to get rid of it. The park ranger told reporters this, alligators are most dangerous when they lose their fear of humans. By allowing an alligator to remain in your pond, you unknowingly give it courage to attack. Apparently, the story article ended this way. The old lady still lives in the shack, but there are no more alligators in the pond. (laughs) Pretty good advice for life, is it not? Some of you, some of us, have some alligators in the pond of life. And repentance is not just saying, God, I'm sorry, all right, and keeping the alligators around. Repentance is saying, listen, I'm sorry, But the alligator's got to go because it is perverse, it is wicked, it is rebellion. Not only a change of perception, but a change of affection. Notice what David says, verse number 8. David says, make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Verse number 10, created me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit in me. Verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence. Verse number 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I hear here that David, I read in these verses, that David had a new affection in life. He was now most concerned with his affection with God. He had the perception change. Now his sin was wicked and perverse and rebellious. Now he said, God, you've got to do some things for me. Three things he desires. He desires to be repaired. Renew a right spirit within me. Repair what is broken, God. I want that affection. I want to delight in you. He has a desire for a relationship. Cast me not away from thy presence. Lord, I want to be close to you. I want us to be okay. And a desire for restoration. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. God, 
I'm missing some things inside. I've got some remorse. I've got some guilty feelings. I've got some uh right here, Lord, and I want us to be okay. I want you to come back, and I want to feel close to you again, a change of affection. You see, for the past year, apparently David didn't care too much. That past year, he was living in sin, though I think under conviction. But here David comes back into repentance. He sees his sin, change of perception, and now sees himself and says, boy, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm messed up on the inside. The Bible says this. That David says that heal the bones that you've broken. Now, scholars don't necessarily think that his bones were broken, but that he was just wore out from conviction and guilt. You ever felt that way in life? Where you're struggling and you just feel the weight of sin. When you confess it and forsake it with true repentance... People will say this, it, feel like, it feels like a weight has been taken off my shoulders. Isn't that neat? Change of affection. At camp, right, young people? You get right at camp and like, oh, man, I'm glad I got right with God. It feels good. Now, there's lots of things that can make us feel good, but true repentance will make us feel good. Change of affection. David says, bring that back to me. I want to feel that again. But see, that's not all of it. It's not just a feeling, but it involves some feelings. He had a change of perception, a change of affection. Lastly, this morning, lastly, he had a change of direction. Look with me in verse number 17, where he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. He said a few verses earlier, that he said to God, if you de- desired sacrifice, I'd sacrifice. Intriguing to me because it reminds me of Saul and Samuel. Where Saul said, the reason I saved these good things, the reason I disobeyed God was to sacrifice, was to show God some good outward, exterior actions. And Samuel said to Saul, to the first king, Saul, God doesn't desire just sacrifices. He doesn't just care about the outside. He cares about the inside as well. Now, well, look, he also cares about the outside. Saul just wanted to deal with the outside. David said, Lord, I want to deal with the inside. Lord, what you want is not a sacrifice or just a sacrifice. You want a broken spirit. God, you want some true humility, change of direction. Change of direction because pride says, I go my way. I know best. Humility says, God, you know best. Whatever you want, brokenness. I won't try to control the consequences. Saul said, honor me now in front of the people. David says, I'm before you. Lord, whatever you want, change of direction. God, whatever you desire, contrite heart, broken spirit, Lord, whatever you want. In life, in spiritual life, that is what has has to happen in repentance. If you're lost, never been saved, you're in your own pride, your own way. You see your sin and you turn back to God and say, God, I come to you for salvation. After you're saved, as a Christian, we make choices and actions, attitudes that displease God. Repentance says, God, I'm coming back to you. I'm sorry, whatever path you have for me, that's the path I want. I won't dictate the path. I won't dictate the situation. Well, God, I'll get right, and we'll do it this way. No, God, whatever you want, it's your way, not my way. That's why it's a change of direction. God isn't just looking for an exterior patch job, but an interior overhaul. Now, what's unique about this is that at the end of Psalm 51... Verse number 19, David says, well, then you'll be pleased with sacrifice. You see, you can't get right with God to change your direction and go God's way and not have the outside change as well. It's not just the inside. It's not just the outside. It's both. Saul just wanted the outside. I don't want to change here. Let's just change this out here. We'll we'll, we'll have fun together. David says, God, I'm right here. But as you change here on the inside... This will be affected out here. Broken and a contrite heart. Brokenness, a humble heart that says, God, whatever you want, I'll do it. 
Someone said, this man is born with his back toward God. When he truly repents, he turns right around and faces God. It was Memorial Day weekend. And Jack took a long look at his speedometer before slowing down 73 and a 55. The flashing red in his rearview mirror, as the story goes, encouraged him and insisted that he stop promptly. Fourth time in four months, Jack thought to himself, he said, how could a guy get caught so often? <laughs> he slumped in the seat, turned the collar of his windbreaker up, covering his ears, and tapped on the steering wheel, giving the idea and his best impression of looking bored and non-caring, his eyes on the mirror watching the police officer get out of his vehicle. The officer stepped out of his vehicle, a big pad in hand, and instantly Jack recognized him as Bob. Bob from church. Jack thought, great. Memorial Day weekend, I play golf with Bob. He's got to be the one that pulls me over. <sighs> so Jack decided to step out of the car. So Jack jumped out and said, hi, Bob. Fancy meeting you at, like this. Hello, Jack, was the response. No emotion, no smile. Guess you caught me red-handed. I'm on my way home to see the wife and kids. Yes, I guess I did, Jack. Well, Bob seemed uncertain, apparently. Jack thought, this is good. This is good. Again, Jack said, I've seen some long days at the office lately. And just, you know, trying to spend time with, with Debbie and the girls. And, uh, boy, she has a picnic this evening. And, uh, boy, you know what I mean, right? i got to get home. Yes, Jack, I know what you mean. Please get back in the vehicle. Come on, Bob, you got to be this way. Jack, how fast I clock you? Well, probably 61, 62. Though Jack knew well, full well, it was 73. Well, Jack was 71. So Jack sat back down, as the story goes, a little flustered. Bob stood outside his window, wrote on a notepad. Well, Jack was really worried now. He never had an officer just write a notepad, didn't ask for his license, didn't ask for insurance, just stood there and wrote as the story goes. <laughs> Whatever reason Bob had for doing this, Jack thought, it can't be good. How much will this cost me? A few minutes later, Bob slipped a folded up note into Jack's window, cracked window. Jack sneered, thanks a lot. As Bob walked back to his vehicle. Jack pulled, or Bob pulled away, and Jack began to read. It wasn't a ticket. It was a note. It said this. Dear Jack, once upon a time, I had a daughter. She was only six years old when killed by a car. You guessed it, speeding driver. A fine and three months in jail, and the man was free, free to hug all three of his daughters again. I only had one, and will never be able to hug her again. A thousand times I've tried to forgive that man. A thousand times I thought I had. Maybe I did, but I need to do it again. Even now, please pray for me, Jack, and be careful. My son is all I have left. Yours truly, Bob. The story goes on to say that Jack sat there for a while. The sneer gone from his face. The anxiety gone from his heart. Begin to sit and contemplate decisions and thoughts in life. Then after a few minutes, put the car in a drive and slowly pulled away. To repentance. Change of perception. Change of affection. Change of direction. In life, God comes to us through his word, through friends, and says, listen, here's a note for you. You're messing up. Some of us with a sneer on our face Drop the car right back into drive and floor it out. And then have the audacity to say, God, why have you let me down? Why have you ruined my life? Why have you done this to me? Not realizing the problem is not God. It's our lack of repentance to repentance. Change of perception, affection, and direction. God's touched your heart. Repent today. Lord, I thank you for your word. 
Lord, I pray that our hearts would be sensitive to you. Lord, there are times in life that we try to cover up the mistakes that we've made, choices. Lord, ignore what you're dealing with us about. Lord, I pray that we would come with true repentance shown to us by David this morning. That we would begin to perceive and see our sin as you see it. To see you who we've offended, Lord, and then see what you want from us. What if you're this morning and say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray that God would help me to respond the right way to him? I don't want to just cover something up or blame shift. God spoke to me. Would you pray that I'd respond the right way? Just slip your hand up for me. God bless you. God bless you. Hands all over. I wonder if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I've never come to Jesus Christ for salvation. Pastor, the truth is I'm a sinner. And I don't want to ignore that sin. I want to repent and ask Jesus Christ to save me. Would you pray for me? that I would come to Jesus Christ to salvation today. Now, I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else, but I'd love to pray for you as well. And who would say, that's me, Pastor Howell. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. God bless you, my friend. I don't want to ignore my sin. I don't want to just push it away and think I can get to heaven some other way. I need to repent today. Who else with this one? Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, more importantly, you know the hearts. Lord, may we turn to you. Lord, as we make mistakes, which unfortunately we will, may we repent and draw nigh to you. Lord, we will see you draw nigh to us. Lord, I pray for this one who lift their hand for salvation, that today they'd be willing to bend their heart to you and repent. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.